relatively recently, I started getting back into Fallout. And one thing that I kind of forgot about that I hate about the Fallout franchise, maybe my least favorite thing, are the video essays. And so what I want to do is just go through a bunch of Fallout 4 video essays or Fallout video essays in general and just talk about why I don't like them. I wanted to start with a random video I got recommended by Grey Gaming, and it's titled, Why the World of Fallout Couldn't Actually Exist. As far as I can tell, his thesis statement, which to be honest was a little bit hard to pick out, comes about 12 minutes and 20 seconds into the video. Why do settlements like Megaton and Girdershade in Fallout 3 or Sanctuary Hills and Bunker Hill live like the bombs just dropped yesterday? These sort of cobbled together shacks, shanties, and scrap metal homes would have been okay in the immediate aftermath of the bomb, but very quickly their residents should have been working on ways to weatherproof and insulate their homes. A single harsh winter or summer would be all it takes to render most of the residents of these domiciles expired. We'll talk about this thesis statement later, but this actually isn't how he starts the video. Instead, he opens with a very long story segment, which lasts for about half the video. It's time to get up. A mushroom cloud, deadliest day in human history. You can last three, maybe four days without clean water. Your log cabin. You start cutting down small trees with your little saw. You don't have a lot of other options right now. He describes what he deems to be a semi-realistic survival technique, hunting animals, building makeshift shelter, and he tries to contrast that with the supposedly unrealistic world of Fallout 3 and 4. To be honest, his story falls a bit flat. Like, it's not bad, but it doesn't feel like he builds suspense for anything. The end of the world just happens, comes and goes, and maybe that's realistic. Maybe all of the guys who have survived nuclear blasts say, there was no suspense, it just happened out of the blue. But, okay, do you remember how Fallout 4 started? War. War never changes. The opening section of the game is only a few minutes longer than the narrative section of this video. In fact, it's shorter if you cut out the black and white cutscene that introduces the whole concept of the series. But once the game actually opens, it does so on a normal home in the future 1960s. They foreshadow the atomic blast with the aptly named vault Tech guy, vault Tech calling, who also explains very important series lore. They stop for a beat with the baby to show how happy the family is. I was thinking we could head to the park for a bit. And miss the World Series? Not gonna happen. Before being called into the living room by Codsworth, where the news tells them about the bomb being dropped. They run to the vault as everyone around them leaves their homes. When they get to the vault, they see the authoritarian power of the state and its amoral behavior. Which, need I remind you, is a core theme to the series. The player runs to the vault, sees the bomb go off, and gets lowered in, just in time to avoid the blast before, twist ending, he gets frozen. That is an interesting and compelling story that deals with interesting and complex themes. And I think we forget about that after we've played through that part of the game 15 times. And while Gray's story might be realistic, it's clear that it was not as well received as the one in Fallout 4, given that so many viewers skipped straight to the halfway point in the video, which suggests that something being realistic does not actually have any bearing on whether or not it's good. <sighs> that being said, I don't actually think the Fallout games are that unrealistic. To be perfectly honest, I struggle to sum up the thesis of Grey Gaming's video, but as best I can tell, his core problem with the game are the living conditions in Fallout settlements. The intentional neglect of their homes paired with the scarcity of food and clean water sources all but assures a society which can no longer develop. This doesn't really make sense as a critique of the game, because it's easy to see that every settlement in Fallout 4 already has access to food and water. From Diamond City to Abernathy Farm, every settlement allocates a significant amount of land to growing food. He also mentions security, but this isn't exactly an oversight by the developers either. Diamond City is successful precisely because its location inside of Fenway Park provides it with a high level of security. And while it's true that other settlements that the player comes across are not as well secured, the entire point of the Minutemen in the lore of the game is to provide security to settlements. That said, he does briefly address Diamond City. 
You somewhat see this in the case of Diamond City, but even then Diamond City seems trapped in the survival stage, with most people living in filthy shacks, camper trailers, school buses, and though they do have access to food and water, a lack of caps can cut that supply pretty quickly. He talks about Diamond City as if they've been sitting around doing nothing for 200 years, which is just not at all true. Like, you're saying they have decent water purification? Do you not see the pipes running all around the city? They have running water in the post-apocalypse. Not to mention 24-7 electricity access, which is reliable enough to support a 24-7 radio station that broadcasts all day, all, all across, across the, the Commonwealth. Commonwealth. That's in addition to the primary school. A school, huh? Yes, every child in Diamond City gets a free education here. We even teach night classes if they have busy day schedules. The science center, the two doctors, the two restaurants, the newspaper, the department store, the hair salon. I mean, Diamond City has more amenities than my hometown. Diamond City is so prosperous that you can literally see it glowing from half a mile away as the stadium lights illuminate the steam coming out of the generator. The great green jewel of the Commonwealth, Diamond City, biggest settlement around. And while it might not look that great, the same could be said for most unplanned settlements in the pre-apocalypse. I mean, the real world. And yeah, a lack of caps could leave someone struggling to survive, but that was also true before the war and in real life. So now we're back down to just the shelter argument, which yeah, Diamond City certainly looks a little bit shabby. That said, compare the inside of this building to the inside of a building in Megaton, which for what it's worth was obviously built by a bunch of total idiots. Notice how there's no light coming through the walls like Gray complains about for Megaton. And oh, what's this, a cinder block? If this is a standard American cinder block, then this wall is eight inches thick. Talk about insulation. Not to mention, almost every single building in the city has some kind of vent or fan or air conditioner or something like that on the outside. So what exactly makes you think these homes are not weatherproof? Just about the only thing that would suggest that these buildings aren't weatherproof is the fact that they're made out of salvage materials, which ironically is one of the things that he said it was not about at the start of the video. So boom. Another liberal destroyed with facts and logic. He also makes a similar point about Tenpenny Tower in Fallout 3. In situations like Tenpenny Tower, where all hierarchical needs are being met or at least within reach, it seems that someone, anyone, should be willing to be able to improve life for those less fortunate, or to try at the very least to build beyond their current circumstances for their children's sake. To be honest, I don't really know much about Fallout 3. I didn't like it very much. I preferred Fallout New Vegas. Is that, um... Hey, you're oh, the geez. one who's been going around helping people around here, right? Yeah. The king says to keep up the good work. He said to give you this. What is it? Maze? I'm thinking, like, he's gonna give me some golden gun that gives me, like, a billion damage. No, he gives me corn. That being said, I did read the Fallout Wiki entry for Tenpenny Tower, and this is a bit of a weird thing to say given that Tenpenny Tower is an improvement made on the wasteland after the apocalypse to better serve Alistair Tenpenny and his wealthy tenants. I guess he thinks they haven't improved it enough? He suggests expanding the hotel, but in the game it's not clear the hotel is even full. Maintaining that level of security is expensive. Expanding unnecessarily would only make it more so. And sure, maybe a luxurious safe haven made just for rich people in the middle of a horrific wasteland isn't as equitable as you'd like, but inequality and the privileges brought about by wealth are actually core themes to the Fallout universe. This, by the way, is why the Abernathys live in such a degraded shack. They're poor, and Diamond City is rich. Welcome to Media Literacy 101. Now, is the Abernathy farm actually a realistic depiction of what poverty would really look like in a real wasteland? I don't know. Is this green fella a realistic depiction of what a real, super mutated human would look like in the real, evil future 1950s? Probably not, because he wasn't made to be. Because it's not about being real. The creators of the game made the super mutant big so that the player would know that he's strong. They made him green so that the player would know that he's mutated. Because as we all know, toxic radiation is green like in Ninja Turtles. The developers didn't make these decisions because they thought they were realistic. They made these decisions in order to communicate information about the world of Fallout to the player, which is exactly what the Abernathy Shack does. But if we take off our media literacy caps and put on our annoying pedant caps, we can get back to Gray's video and ask, is the Abernathy Shack actually unrealistic? 
Well, Gray suggests it's maladapted to adverse weather, which, strictly speaking, is not true. Sorry to burst your realism bubble, but there is no winter in Fallout 4. The developers did put Christmas decorations in Diamond City that only show up during December, but the developers intentionally left out snow or any other indication of cold weather from the game. We have no idea what sorts of impacts nuclear blasts could have on the climate in real life. However, we know without a doubt what the weather is like in Fallout 4, and that weather is moderate temperatures all the time. So even if you are the kind of annoying pedant who cares about realism in games, the Abernathy Shack is perfectly plausible. Anyways, after that, Gray sort of goes on a rant about Vocabulary is incredibly important for the development of society. This is just one reason why political correctness and censorship is an idiotic regressive practice. Being able to define the difference between telling someone you like them, you like like them, and you love them. Okay, sometimes English suck. The conclusion of which is essentially just that people in the Fallout universe would still have survival skills, and so... We wouldn't be looking at that same 5,000 year climb that separates civilizations like Mesopotamia and Egypt from our present day. Instead, we're probably looking more like the rapid progress that separates the late Baroque period from the Industrial Revolution. And I think this is kind of totally ridiculous. How does this guy have any idea how long it would take to recover from total nuclear annihilation? How can he possibly be so sure? It took thousands of years for Europe to recover from the fall of Rome, and that didn't involve, I'll say it again, uh, total atomic annihilation. <laughs> Sure, the people of Fallout would have some advantages over humans starting from scratch, but they also face additional challenges that humans in the Baroque period did not. For example, the exact same things he focuses on in his video. Security, for example, is a lot harder in the Fallout universe. How concerned would you be about having insulation in your walls if every fly you came across was 18 inches in diameter and spat radioactive goop at you if you got too close? You've only got so much time in the day, and if you have to choose between spending your day building a machine gun turret and insulating your walls, well, I know what I would do. Water. The people of the Baroque period didn't process their water, and instead, they took water directly from rivers and streams. This was normal for most of human history, and it's still normal in many parts of the world today. Humanity in the Fallout universe doesn't have that same luxury because all surface water is highly radioactive. You either need to drink groundwater or purify the water with machines. Water purification, by the way, is not only a major plot point in Fallout 1, but also the entire plot of Fallout 3, whose central goal is to establish a water purification system that will purify and deradiate all of the water in the Fallout 3 wasteland, which is another great example of wastelanders improving the world for their children that he just does not mention in that earlier section. Food which, by the time the game actually takes place, is probably pretty similar to the situation in the Baroque period due to the widespread circulation of domesticated crops, which is just another example of how wastelanders have advanced since the bombs dropped. Of course, most of the meat in the Fallout world is radioactive, which is certainly not something that people in the Baroque period would have had to deal with. My point is that in a world where surviving is way harder, it's only natural that people's survival situations appear a lot more dire and precarious, which, again, is how the Abernathys are presented. Need I remind you that they are the very first settlement that the player is sent to assist after meeting the Minutemen, and their whole purpose narratively is to establish how dire the situation is in the Commonwealth. Not because of the bombs which dropped 200 years ago, but because of the sabotage of the Commonwealth Provisional Government by the Institute, and the subsequent decline and near collapse of the Minutemen that happens right before the game starts. When you talk to the Abernathys, they're surprised that anyone even showed up. They didn't think calling the Minutemen would work, but they did it anyways, because they had no other option. That is to say, people in Fallout 4's Commonwealth aren't struggling because they're living like the bombs went off yesterday. They're struggling because they're living in a failed state. How's that for lousy lore, huh, Gray? Or should I say, gay? And as long as we're talking about the Minutemen, it's worth mentioning the fact that the player creates the shelter for these people. This is the standout feature of Fallout 4 that makes it different from its predecessors. Like, yeah, some of the settlements come with shabby shacks but even those are expected to be modified and built upon by the player. When he says that Sanctuary Hills was occupied as is, he's wrong. You're supposed to modify the settlement to make it fit for occupation 
and I, for one, had a lot of fun doing that. But why should fun and creativity and good game design stand in the way of realism? And sure, you can build more shabby shacks, but you can also build a super solid sturdy home, as Gray does at the end of his video to demonstrate what he thinks the housing in Fallout should look like. At the conclusion of his video, Gray reiterates his main points, so I'll reiterate my rebuttals. Number one, farmers should have homes which protect them from the elements. They do. At least, they withstand the elements that we actually see in the game. I'll admit that if they added blizzards without changing the building style, it would be a little unfitting. Even if we assume that these shacks can't hold up to weather, that might just be the necessary trade-off that people living in the Commonwealth have to make because it's so difficult to survive out there. It might not be worth it to spend that much time building a home when you have so many other things to do to stay alive. Rural farmers in the Commonwealth, like the Abernathys, are supposed to be struggling with the collapse of the Minutemen, so it would be a little bit weird, narratively speaking, if they lived in a well-built, well-maintained home. And a large portion of the settlers in the Commonwealth are living in homes that the player built, so if they're rickety, whose fault is that? Number two, running water and suitable crops. They have those, too. And 1E, it's a video game. I've kind of been trying to get at this for the whole video. The title of the series is Lousy Lore, but this video discusses almost no actual lore. It's not really a critique of the lore of the game to say that the style of architecture used in the game is unrealistic. Because, again, it's a video game. You're expected to use a little suspension of disbelief. I mean, what would be the difference between saying, this shelter is unrealistic, and saying, this laser rifle is unrealistic? Yeah, maybe all that stuff is unrealistic, but who cares? It's a video game, and it isn't meant to be realistic. It's meant to tell a story that's compelling and interesting and fun. This is compelling, interesting, and fun. You know what wouldn't be compelling, interesting, or fun? A realistic small town built out of sticks and mud made to insulate from cold weather. In fact, I think it's really telling that in his realistic survival story, he uses footage from Skyrim and not Fallout because the thing that he's suggesting would be a total divergence from the aesthetic of the Fallout universe that he couldn't find any examples of in the game. I'll end with a question. If you don't want to play a game set in the post-apocalypse, why are you playing Fallout? I really would have preferred like 100 caps or even like 10 caps. I would have preferred to corn. Even if corn is worth more than 10 caps, I would have preferred 10 caps because it's just such an insulting thing. It's like if I went to a restaurant and tipped you like two cents, you would have probably preferred me to tip you nothing because two cents isn't worth much of anything to you, is it? Hope not.